Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian have been confirmed dead after their helicopter crashed on Sunday. Iranian government has called this an accident, attributing the tragedy to bad weather conditions and a technical failure. The crash occurred at a time of rising tensions in the Middle East. What more do we know about the accident and how will Iran fill the power vacuum? And how might this influence Iran's domestic and international policies, as well as its involvement in the region? Join us for our discussion today, live from Beijing. I'm Xu Qingduo. Joining me for today's show are Professor Saeed Mohammed Morandi and Professor Ford Izadi from the University of Tehran. John Galvinian, uh, Executive Director of the Middle East Center from the University of Pennsylvania, and Professor Wang Jin from Northwest University of China. Welcome to the dialogue. Uh, Professor Morandi, I will start with you. You know, it's bad weather, thick fog, and a technical failure that led to the crash of the helicopter. That's all we know so far. Uh, we also know that the investigation into the cause is, uh, uh, you know, continues. Uh, so what's the latest? Uh, is there anything more we know about the tragedy? No, at the moment, uh, that is uh, more or less what we know. There will be an investigation, but uh, the evidence so far seems to indicate that it was an accident. When the helicopter took off, the weather was clear uh, from the photos that I've seen, and then it entered heavy fog and uh, heavy rain, which also turned into snow a bit later. The, the area was mountainous and it was a forest. Um, we have had actually a very, uh, d uh, a lot of rain during the past month, which is not really normal for this type of year. It's been very windy. For example, here in Tehran, we had rain last night, and uh, usually the rainy season ends earlier. So it does seem to be a, a very tragic accident. Of course, the helicopter was an older helicopter, and uh, it was, if I'm not mistaken, an American helicopter. And uh, the Americans have uh, imposed an embargo uh, they've imposed maximum pressure or sanctions against Iran, so spare parts are uh, difficult to uh, to gain access to. Um, I'm not saying that that has anything to do with it, but it's something that uh, should keep it be kept in mind that the Americans have always been targeting civilian infrastructure, civilian civilian airlines uh, through the sanctions. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be so far. Uh, the case that there's anything beyond what you have already described. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Professor Izadi, you know, as uh, Professor Morandi mentioned about, um, you know, this helicopter, it's said to be a 1979 American-built uh, helicopter. So uh, over the past 40 plus years, we know that there's uh, the U.S. sanctions on the uh, country, and uh, of course there are reports of the lack of uh, replacement parts. Uh, for this kind of helicopter and probably other, uh, you know, American uh, built uh, uh, planes there. You know, this is not the single instant, let's say, uh, accident, uh, you know, over the past years. There are also other, uh, you know, uh, cases like this, uh, you know, people would blame for the sanctions. Is that the case? Uh, of course, uh, American sanctions uh, have caused difficulties uh, for Iran uh, in the last uh, number of decades. Uh, I think we have to wait and see uh, for uh, the investigations to go through the uh, Iranian uh, uh, chief of uh, armed forces, uh, General Bagheri, ordered uh, an investigation yesterday. Um, so. We are going to have technical experts uh, looking at uh, what has happened, uh, and uh, we just have to wait and see. There is, uh, it's not a good idea to uh, make conclusions before uh, that investigation is over. Mm -hmm. uh, well, John, uh, you know, what more do we know about uh, President Raisi and his tenure in Iran? You know, we do have uh, condolences sent from different parts of the world. 
you know, from, uh, say, uh, Pakistan, from Turkey, from Arab countries, uh, Russia, China, European nations. Uh, uh, and so uh, w what have been the, uh, you know, like, say, uh, the, w what do you see this uh, you know, international reaction to his passing here? Do we have John? Oh, I'm sorry, the question yeah. was for me. I, I apologize. Um, President Raisi was seen uh, during the three years or so of his tenure as uh, obviously a much more conservative um, politician than his predecessor, President Rouhani. He was seen very much as the supreme leader's man uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, he, you know, he came to power um, as uh, the sort of culmination of 20, more than 20 years of um, really uh, divisive and, and, and um, quite unpredictable Iranian politics, uh, a lot of internal power struggles between reformists, moderates, conservatives, um, and his, uh, his presidency was seen as a sort of triumph uh, of the conservative camp. Um, he uh, won his election on record low turnout in an election where not a lot of um, serious opposition was allowed to stand. Um, on the other hand, what that meant for the Supreme Leader and for the sort of cadre of more conservative politicians in Iran was that for the first time Iran had a, a relatively unified um, uh, uh, conservative um, hold across all elements of power in the Islamic Republic. Um, you know, he was also, of course, being touted as a potential future Supreme Leader, and that will uh, throw up all kinds of interesting questions as well uh, for the succession, ultimately, uh, in Iran. Uh, but for the moment, I believe your question was also about kind of international uh, reactions. Um, the United States and other adversaries of Iran have had to walk a delicate line. Of course, they have sent official condolences, but um, have also kind of laced their comments with, um, you know, not very thinly veiled critiques of his uh, of his presidency and of the Islamic Republic in general. Mm -hmm. uh, Wang Wang Jian, you know, in addition to domestic politics uh, and also if you look at their foreign policy here, of course, we have the passing of the foreign minister, uh, basically President Raisi and Foreign <coughs> Minister Abdullahim, you know, they have established themselves over the past about three years at the faces um, of Iran in global stages. How do you characterize their foreign policies? I think the foreign policies uh, under uh, Raisi and as well as Abdullahim uh, actually were very uh, moderate and also very uh, active because on the one hand before uh, he assumed the power uh, in 2000 uh, in, in 2021 a lot of uh, 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 analysis from the Western world especially from the United States that they they uh, they, they are uh, they perceived the ISIS uh, assumption the power would lead Iran to the very more aggressive for, uh, foreign policies in the region as well as in, in, in the international arena, especially given the Raisi, uh, Raisi's very strong uh, I mean, political experience covering uh, religious uh, fields as well as uh, very uh, justice fields. So that is why this uh, some of the uh, the the the, the, uh, the, the, the they try to. Uh, describe the Iran's uh, foreign policy on the Raisi as well as Abdurrahman as a very very aggressive manner. But then, if we look at the, uh, what happened during the past three years, I mean, nearly past three years uh, on the Raisi as well as Abdurrahman, that Iran uh, actually their foreign policy uh, were very moderate and, and as well, uh, of course, very active. On the one hand, Iran tried to uh, maintain a very uh, positive relations with the regional countries, especially the neighboring countries. And we know that the rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia under the mediation of China, as well as regional countries such as Iraq, such as Oman, and they succeeded. So they made it. So this is a very, very big achievement. And then on the other hand, the uh, Iran's foreign policies during the past two or three years uh, were very active because they tried to make uh, friends uh, with uh, with the every with with as many as possible the, I mean, in in this world. For example, they tried to uh, uh, develop a very active friendship with Russia. They tried to develop a very uh, good relations with other neighboring and uh, international countries. So that that is why Iran's foreign policies uh, this was not. Uh, as perceived uh, by some some kind of the Western analysis as a very aggressive or very very 
uh, uh, very negative, but actually they played a very moderate role in this region, pacifying the, uh, contribute a lot for pacifying the tension, uh, growing tension, especially uh, in the Middle East. So that is why they contributed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, uh, we'll come back to talk about more about uh, you know uh, Iranian uh, you know implications of the passing of the politicians in this region and around the world. Of course, their foreign policy making. Uh, Professor Morandi, if you look at, uh, of course, people are focusing on uh, what will happen next. Uh, you know, who will fill the uh, the power vacuum? You know, how will it uh, or in any way uh, you know influence the function of the government or you know or normal operation of the nation? Uh, what's your take on that? The Constitution is very clear. Uh, the president uh, has a first vice president. He has assumed uh, the authority of the president until elections uh, will be carried out. Uh, elections will be carried out in roughly 40 days. So 40 days from now, we will have uh, a new president. Uh, we'll have to see what sort of candidates step forward in the coming days after the funeral. Uh, today was the first funeral. They held it in the city of Tabriz near where the hel helicopter crashed. And it was an amazing crowd. In fact, a reformist MP who had just given an interview, Dr. Pezeshkian, a few hours ago, he said that he's never seen such a crowd in the city before. It's, it is unprecedented. And uh, the expectation is that the funeral in Tehran, which will be held tomorrow, will be similar to the funeral of General Soleimani, and uh, which will run very much in conflict with the narrative in the West about the Islamic Republic being unpopular at home. So uh, Iran's enemies and uh, um, um, opponents will be silenced for a while, but they will go back to bashing Iran, I'm sure, very, very soon. But um, uh, I think uh, I, what I would like to add here is that President Raisi building upon what your previous guest rightly pointed out, he had major achievements in Iranian in foreign policy. He uh, uh, broadened Iran's relationships, not only with regional countries, but with countries across Asia. Iran joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization under his presidency. Then Iran joined BRICS. So uh, Asian integration is a top priority for him. Regional cooperation, uh, better relations with neighbors, top, top priority. And also through BRICS, the hope is that uh, financial institutions, which have been monopolized by the West, will be um, uh, broadened uh, to create a more uh, a, a multi, to help bring about a multipolar order. So he has done a lot for Iranian foreign policy, and he has also turned the economy around. Last year, uh, the two years when he after he came to power, we had over four percent growth, and this year, this last year, we had over six percent growth. The economic situation is difficult for ordinary people still, but the economy has turned around. So he he and we will see tomorrow that he is actually a very pop popular figure because he has been working hard to broaden the social welfare network for the more disenfranchised, and that makes him uh, particularly popular among that uh, group of people. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Professor Maradi, you know, uh, speak of uh, the popularity, of course, I have to uh, quote, uh, you know, John Kirby, the U.S. White House national security spokesperson, um, you know, his comments on the uh, uh, pre President Ra Raisi. He said, uh, you know, he's responsible for the terrorist networks in the region and had a lot of blood on his hand. Um, what's your response to that? Well, uh, Kirby, who is supporting a genocide in Gaza, really is n in no position to say anything. And I think it's a badge of honor when the United States uh, attacks uh, someone like President Raisi. Uh, Hezbollah, which I'm sure he's alluding to, was created as a result of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. They cap the, the Israeli regime occupied the capital, and it was only then that Hezbollah was created as a national liberation organization. And they succeeded in uh, kicking, out, kicking out the Israeli regime from Lebanon in the year 2000. Uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad and other resistance organizations in Palestine are fighting for their freedom, just as the ANC and other uh, political organizations in South Africa were fighting against apartheid, and ultimately they succeeded. So um, the Americans are always on the 
wrong side of history. And uh, sadly, they will continue to be so, and it will be to their detriment because they are losing clout across the world. They are becoming, uh, they are seen as complicit in this genocide alongside the Israelis. And uh, in future, they will not be able to criticize any major country, whether it's Iran, China, Russia, or anyone else, about human rights because they are the worst violators of all. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Izadi, of course, uh, President Raisi is seen as a possible successor uh, to the Supreme Leader um, Ayatollah Khamenei. Will his passing in any sense affect that kind of power transition in this country? Uh, before answering your question, let me uh, remind your viewers that uh, uh, a lot of times when uh, we have Western experts uh, on uh, these talk shows, they try to question the democracy in Iran. They try to uh, demonize Iranian leaders. Uh, it, and the point they're trying to make is that if the country they're talking about, if, if that country has good relations with the West, then they have democracy. If they don't have good relations with the West, then uh, whatever they do in terms of democratic practices is not acceptable. And I think we experienced that in this show uh, as well. Uh, demonizing other countries, sanctioning other countries, um, engaging in genocide in 21st century um, is not a good practice. I would advise American leaders and the people who get their lead from these leaders to maybe change course. With regard to uh, the next uh, supreme leader, you know, that, that's another example of uh, democracy in Iran. The people who uh, choose the leader are uh, directly elected uh, by the people. Uh, and uh, today, actually, was uh, the, the first day of their uh, biannual meeting. Uh, uh, they are uh, one of the jobs they have is to monitor different people in the country that uh, can uh, become the country's leader in case the person who's leading the country today uh, passes away or that there are other problems. Um, so, uh, like Iran's presidency, the person who leads the country uh, does so through a democratic uh, process. Uh, they. Uh, there were a number of people that uh, uh, were in position of replacing the current leader if uh, th that becomes uh, something that's necessary. Uh, and yes, President Raisi uh, was uh, one of the people that uh, was talked about. Uh, there are others uh, that uh, can uh, take that position. Uh, within that assembly of experts, the, the uh, parliament or the organization that uh, is in charge of uh, choosing the leader is called the Assembly of Experts. Uh, th there is a committee that uh, has a list of people who uh, can uh, become the country's leader based on their opinion. And if it becomes necessary to choose the next leader, then there is going to be a vote. The Assembly has 83 members. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, whoever gets the highest vote will become the country's leader. Uh, so I don't think uh, Iran will face any difficulties uh, having its next uh, president. You're going to see a new president in Iran in about two months. And I don't think uh, Iran will have any difficulty uh, with regard to the leadership uh, uh, of the country. Uh, and this has been the case in the last uh, 45 years. So. Uh, my suggestion for Western leaders is to do something else uh, in terms of uh, advancing their uh, policy goals with Iran. Uh, uh, focusing on the democratic process in Iran is not really co going to work out for them. Mm -hmm. uh, well, John, uh, of course, what's your take uh, on you know s same question? You know whether this power transition uh, in any way will be affected, or whether that will be affected the country's normal operation. And, uh, you know, most importantly, uh, what are the, you know, say, challenges, you know, domestically in particular, for a, a new administration? Well, I think, first of all, um, you know, it's important to emphasize the Supreme Leader is, is alive and uh, remains alive uh, for the foreseeable future. 
Uh, we have no way of really being able to speculate. Only God knows, of course, when that time will come. Um, and in politics, a lot can change very quickly. Uh, this week should remind us that sometimes things can change very, very quickly. Um, so to be speculating too much on the future um, leadership of Iran is a, you know, potentially a, a fool's errand. But having said all of that, I do think one of the things that is, is interesting to, to watch in the coming weeks and months um, is the role of the Revolutionary Guard uh, and some of its senior members. Uh, President Raisi was considered a front runner uh, for a potential future as a potential future supreme leader. Um, the other major front runner that is often talked about is uh, Mushtaba Khamenei, the, the son of the supreme leader. Um, other than those two, though, there's a large field of potential candidates, none of whom have really mm, solidified a significant support base or have really been. Um, convincing yet as serious contenders for the supreme leadership. What that means um, is that whoever does eventually uh, take on that role, I think will probably have to rely at least initially much more on the, on the, on the support uh, of the Revolutionary Guards. Um, whether that is, if that is Khamenei's son, he is going to face um, a faction of people uh, who don't view his leadership as uh, fully uh, legitimate or um, as um, his religious credentials as strong as perhaps his father's. And so, you know, he will have to rely on the Revolutionary Guards. If it is somebody else um, who becomes Supreme Leader, again, that's going to be somebody who is not going to be emerging with a very, very large support base. Uh, and again, I think that, that points to a more significant role for the Revolutionary Guards. The reason I say that is over the last several years, uh, the Pastoran and the Guards have uh, begun to develop a more and more um, influential role, either formally or informally, in Iranian politics. Um, and what that tells you is that I think, you know, you have to kind of look at the, I mean, the Guards, of course, is not a monolith, uh, but many of its members have politics um, that can be described as perhaps a little bit more um, militaristic uh, or adventurous uh, than some of the more cautious uh, um, and um, pragmatic uh, policies of the Ayatollahs who rule the country. Um, I, you know, I think that I don't want to overstate this. I'm not one of these people who wants to come in and, and paint lots of kind of elaborate divisions within the Islamic Republic. I do think that on the whole, the Islamic Republic um, will, you know, express a certain level of continuity in its um, in its uh, policies and in its leadership and in its government. Have, having said that, though, I think that there um, will be a potential in the coming years. Um, for a, an Islamic Republic whose foreign policy and whose regional policies um, follow a line that is perhaps um, more focused on um, military adventurism, perhaps, and that could even affect things like the nuclear file. I think there's a lot of um, feeling among certain members of the uh, elites and the revolutionary guards that um, the time may be coming for Iran to begin to rethink its nuclear posture as well. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I'm going to be uh, looking for in the next uh, weeks and months. Yeah, John, you mentioned about the nuclear program. Uh, you wrote a piece last year, uh, late last year, about uh, the possible change of attitudes, at least in Iran, about uh, the acceptance of uh, you know, having the nuclear um, like bomb, for example. Uh, tell us more about that. You know, uh, is the change undergoing or with the passing of the president? Will that have any impact on this uh, kind of a choice? This is something I'm actually quite concerned about. And now I happen to uh, disagree with a lot of the, stand, the sort of standard Western narrative about Iran's nuclear program. I don't think that, for example, in the early 2000s, when this uh, crisis uh, first began, that Iran actually had a very serious appetite for a nuclear uh, bomb. I actually think that um, a lot of this crisis was self-perpetuating, self-fulfilling, even manufactured. Um, and, but what I do think is that over the course of the last 20 years, it has taken on a very self-fulfilling kind of um, cycle where Iran has slowly enriched more uranium, sometimes as an act of defiance or a, or a stronger negotiating position at various points. Um, but it has almost um, drifted its way to a breakout capacity to the point where today Iran is a sort of is a de facto nuclear capable state uh, that could develop a bomb in very, very short order if it wants to. And yet it has never chosen to do that. Um, the reason it has not chosen to do that is, be is because the supreme leader and those around him have felt very strongly that Iran is still better off following the kind of playing by the rules and demonstrating its adherence to the, to the nuclear non-proliferation treaty um, rather than trying to break out for a bomb. Uh, there are also religious reasons for that. Um, but I do think 
the, you know, for example, the, you know, the Ayatollah has issued a fatwa for you know, many years against the development of uh, nuclear weapons. He says that they are um, sinful, that they are not Islamic, and the Islamic Republic will never pursue them. Having said that, there have been a lot of quiet voices over the years that have suggested that maybe Iran should take a different approach, that it should take a more kind of North Korean approach and potentially even leave the NPT and just develop a bomb. I think we're increasingly finding those voices have been silenced and kept marginalized for a long time because they disagree with the, with the leadership um, mm-hmm. of the Supreme Leader. But I think that Iran is now in a very difficult and change, rapidly changing position. It just exchanged military hostilities with Israel, a country that has at least 100 nuclear weapons. Um, and you have been seeing more and more comments quietly and maybe not so quietly uh, these days. Uh, people sort of in Iran saying, well, you know, maybe we should just go ahead and build a bomb. Uh, I mean, if we've come this far, um, what have we really gained by taking a conciliatory, uh, constructive approach? We've only gained more sanctions and more um, hardship for the Iranian people. Um, and as Iran's security environment becomes more and more dangerous, uh, both in terms of the, the, its uh, conflict with Israel, but also, um, you know, just you know, the, 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 the wider atmosphere that we're in, uh, with the United States divided, distracted, with an election campaign coming up, and now with a... I don't want to say leadership vacuum, but a small power vacuum, at least uh, for the coming period. Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised if you start to see some real changes in Iran's nuclear posture. Yeah. Uh, Professor Mirandi, uh, you know, your response, especially with uh, uh, U.S. elections upcoming, you know, uh, Donald Trump uh, could well come back to the White House. Uh, So will that have any impact on the relationship between, uh, you know, the two countries and also uh, probably uh, the nuclear policy of Iran? Well, a couple of things first. One is that uh, President Raisi wasn't a candidate for the leadership. Uh, This was his name was discussed among different people, but if he was actually a candidate, he wouldn't have chosen to stand for presidency because the president has a very tough job and has very difficult decisions to make, and it's not going to necessarily make someone more popular. So if he wanted to be, let's say, a a candidate for the leader, he would have stayed at the head of the judiciary, he could have fought corruption and remained a popular and well-known figure uh, than he was. So that, that doesn't fit with the narrative. The leader's son is also not a candidate, and I have. Uh, there's no doubt that he will not be the future leader. It depends on the Council of Experts, as was alluded to before by Dr. Izadi. They will make a choice. At the moment, the leader is very healthy. Uh, in the dis- but in the distant future, when uh, he passes away, that Council of Experts will immediately choose a new leader. We've already had that before when Imam. Khomeini passed away. With regards to Iran's nuclear program, I don't think uh, there will be any change. Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini is, as I said, very healthy. But in the future, I don't see any change uh, with regards to that. I don't think there will be any extra influence by any uh, military commander that could change that. The only thing that could change that would be if there's some sort of imminent threat against the nation. In other words, if there's an imminent threat made by the Israeli regime or someone to use nuclear weapons against Iran, Mm -hmm. that may uh, change calculations because the Israeli regime has already threatened to, you know, senior officials have already threatened to use nuclear weapons against Gaza. Uh, So, and it is not a sane regime. It is a, a um, a genocidal regime, and the genocide is being supported by the United States and the West. But as things stand, the Iranians have no intention of doing that. The Iranians believe that ultimately the Zionist project will collapse under the weight of its own uh, well, contradictions. We have to and, stop uh, there, uh, uh, Professor Morandi. Well, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu Qingdu. See you next time.